May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to another Duke Audio Podcast. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable, free from economic hardship, and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of the universal precept to do as little harm as possible. So today we have a another piece in the seemingly never-ending series, Tassara Stories. Uh, we're right at the end uh, at uh, the list here. Uh, I mean, I, there might be one or two others. Um, and um, I'm sure I could write some more, but I'd have to get some notes together and everything. And there's more than we need now. So this, these are pieces uh, uh, in uh, a work in progress, uh, Tassara Stories, The Early Years with Shunyu Suzuki. So this one uh, is entitled Mountains and Waters. Carl Bielfeld was an early student of Suzuki's who went on to become a preeminent Buddhist scholar and professor at Stanford University on July 21st, 1999, he gave a talk at Tassajara on what is often called the Mountains and Rivers Sutra. One of the fascicles of Soto Zen founder Dogen's Shobo Ginzo, Carl said, the Mountains and Waters Sutra is a text written in 1240 by the founder of the monastic order that created, ultimately, Tassajara. When I was a graduate student at Berkeley back in the early 70s studying with Suzuki Roshi, I was looking for a topic to write about for my master's thesis, and Suzuki Roshi said, why don't you do the Mountains and Waters Sutra? He said, I love this text, and I would love to have an English translation of it and then give a series of lectures on it. Working with Suzuki Roshi to translate this Mountains and Waters Sutra at Tassajara, that last summer he was down here, was much nicer than digging the latrines for the hill cabins, which I had done the summer before. Not long after Suzuki died, Richard Baker gave Gary Snyder the translation that Carl had done with Suzuki's help. Snyder had been working since the 50s on a long poem titled Mountains and Rivers Without End. Snyder told Carl years later that reading his translation had set him back 10 years in his work on that poem because what was in that thing was so problematic and so juicy for this topic of mountains and rivers without end that he set to brooding about it, said Carl. It talks about nature and the natural world, and I think many of us have a feeling that one of the things that Buddhism can offer us is a different take on nature, a healthier take on nature than many of the ones that seem to have been in our heritage in the Western tradition. But when we look around at Buddhist scriptures for a validation of that sense, we have a Buddhism it's not easy to find. You do not find many Buddhist script scriptures that talk about what we would call the broad category of nature. But Dogen does. In the Mountains and Water Sutra, we have a rare case of a Zen master talking about nature, and that's attractive. We cling to it. It's like feminists looking for a feminist view in Buddhism. When they find something, they cling to that and ignore 99% of the trashing of women that goes on in Buddhism. A sutra <laughs> is supposed <laughs> a sutra is supposed to be words that came directly from Shakyamuni Buddha, but Mahayana Buddhism 
created many new sutras and pretended they came from Buddha. Here Carl says, Dogen implies the mountains and waters themselves are preaching this sutra. You hear Tassahara Creek speaking to us, speaking not just about Tassahara Creek, but speaking the Buddha Dharma all the time, and the mountains are doing so also. They are a sutra. They are a text that we can read as we walk around. Dogen, Carl says, quotes one of the Zen masters from China who says, mountains are always walking, and then he says, what does this mean? And the way he talks about it, it is clear he is invoking in poetic terms something that we see in a lot of textbooks about Buddhism, namely that everything is always changing. The mountains are walking can be a kind of metaphor, not just for the sense we have when we are up on Jew's Ridge and see the mountains as if they were walking out to the ocean, but a metaphor for a Buddhist philosophical notion that everything, even the most permanent things around us, are constantly changing in every moment. They aren't things, they are events, tiny, tiny events, sort of like subatomic events going on constantly, all the time. If you have read any books about Buddhism, you have come across this doctrine of no self or impermanence, and he uses that to deconstruct the solidity of the mountains and to give us a sense that these things are alive in some sense, going on bang, 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 like that. The mountains and rivers of the present are actually becoming present at this moment and implicitly at least urging us to get with that. In one sense, this is a fantastic way of talking about the landscape as a sentient being, but it is also done so through the sense of merging the people who have inhabited the land with the landscape. This is what Gary Snyder loves to do. He wanders around in the Great Basin, finding the old legends of the Indians who lived there. I was thinking about this when my brother and I went up to see Suzuki Roshi's site up the hill that I visit every time I come down here, and I realized these mountains and waters around us have a certain history already. Even though we don't know the history of the Indians here, we can only imagine it. And we can only imagine the 19th century Chinese who built the road in here and so on. Still, already there is a lore developing in these mountains and rivers that will be part of their meaning for us. I think for many of us already, even if it is only a few decades old, it all goes well and things aren't too impermanent. In that sense, the mountains will grow. There are young mountains, the coast range, and this young Buddhism is growing with these mountains so that historical sense of the landscape is going to become richer and richer and richer. At one point, Suzuki Roshi told me, why don't you look at this text? So I started looking at it, and it's very difficult. So I came to him and I said, wait a second, this is way over my head. And he said, yes, this is a very difficult, interesting text. And I said, yeah, the language of it is so hard to understand. And he said, it's not the language, it's the thought. This isn't just poetry, it's the, th it's the philosophy that makes it make sense. It's very difficult to understand. I think he saw it as somehow not philosophy in the abstract sense or technical sense, but as a text, very rich in Buddhist thought. What a shame that he died without giving a commentary on it. He was going to give a regular series of lectures at Tassahara on it. It would have been fantastic. When I said to him, isn't this a bit stupid for someone like me to be 
translating something so deep and rich? He said, yep, get on with it. The following words Suzuki said about the Lotus Sutra apply equally to this fascicle by Dogen. We also say you should read the scripture with your body. But what we mean by that is that not just this scripture only has eternal truth. Universal truth is truly with this scripture, with bodhisattvas, with various kinds of followers of Buddhism, and with rivers and mountains and everything. So to read this scripture with the body means to find the truth of it in everything, in everyday activity. There's a big difference. So the merit of reading this scripture is in finding the truth of it in our everyday activity. We read this scripture so that we can understand more perfectly and become familiar with the truth. This is our attitude toward scriptures. This has been a Cuke Audio Podcast. I'm D.C. Puba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, coming to you from Sleepy Senor with Doggy Bandita, Feline Cuchita, and Dear Lovely Katrinka. And we're wishing you, and yours, and all of us, a grand awakening. Thank you.